to St. Jacob Lutheran Church. Good morning. Good morning. Today our focus is on the Gospel, and Jesus asks us to take up a cross. It is not an easy road to heaven. God never promised that everything would be perfect on this life. In fact, He said this cross would be something we have to do. And our sermon series reflects that. Uh, we're discussing the Savior I want, and the Savior I want is one that looks like a hero. And we'll see that we really need a hero that is something different. Let me begin by singing our opening hymn, that's 542.
service this morning, we use the service of the word that is found on page 38 in the front of your hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
This is the word of the Lord. We invite you to sing Psalm 73 that's on page 94 in your hymnal. It's on the screen. Listen to uh, the refrain. We'll all sing the song together. confidently in God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received this reconciliation. This is the epistle of our Lord. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. I'm really ashamed of this cross. Do you believe me? No, I'm just teasing. I shouldn't be, right? Because Jesus, out of love, died on that terrible instrument of death because he loved me. And yet sometimes people love other things more, huh? And maybe somebody says, you know, I love playing video games. And you don't share what you love, right? Or, I love fishing. And then you don't say how much you love Jesus. Or, somebody says, I love watching this television show. And you don't say the most, the most important thing I love is Jesus. It's easy to not open up and share our faith, huh? We're ashamed of what people will say, right? I don't want people not to like me. I don't want to be really cool. But Jesus isn't ashamed of you. Jesus not only was not ashamed of you, he <coughs> paid the ultimate sacrifice for you. Help us not to be ashamed, huh? I'm proud to wear this cross. I'm proud to say that I'm a believer in Jesus by God's grace. I'm proud to be able and privileged to serve as a minister. I should never be ashamed of Jesus on this cross, right? And neither should you. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, sometimes we are ashamed of the cross, and ashamed of our faith, and we don't Proclaim it as much. We're afraid of the consequences, and yet we live in a society that there really isn't the persecution as far as death. Help us not be ashamed to say that we believe in you and your Son and the cross and forgiveness and what we believe in. Help us to be bold and confident to admit that we are Christians, that we have faith in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for all our sins, and then maybe we can share that with someone who doesn't have that faith and confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the welcome. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. This is also our sermon text for today. Um, the stark reality is the love of God uh, is inseparable from the cross, both his and ours. The cross of the Christian is likewise as real as the glory that follows. And yet the reality is no cross, no cross. <coughs> the cross is a necessary consequence of his redemptive work. It's not the cause, but nevertheless it's a, a consequence. It is all, uh, it, it, it is all that all suffering that comes as a result of, of following Jesus. That's what he means when he takes up a cross, uh, us to take up a cross. That might mean persecution or excruciating pain or denying of self. Our cross drives us to his cross, both for forgiveness and for strength. We read from Mark chapter 8. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, be killed, and after three days rise again. He was speaking plainly to them. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But after turning around and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have your mind set on the things of God, but on the things of men. He called the crowd and his disciples together and said to them, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. After all, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? 
In fact, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We continue by singing the sermon hymn, uh, 465. Mm -hmm.
of it is recorded in the sermon. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our spiritual hero. Dear friends of Christ, people want a hero, a warrior, a champion, someone who they can look up to. They want a person who is admired for their courage, their outstanding achievements, and their noble qualities. In biblical times, people often admired kings, pharaohs, Caesars, or military commanders. <clears throat> After World War II, America admired generals like D. Dwight D. Eisenhower, George S. Patton, and Douglas MacArthur. Today, people may idolize, uh, idealize athletes like Patrick Mahomes, Caitlin Clark, and Stephen Curry. Teenagers may admire comic book characters like Superman, Spider-Man, and Wonder Woman. What people look for in a hero is someone to lead them. They want a winner and a champion. The world needs more than ever it is spiritual help. And people need saving that requires a savior. But what, what type of savior do people want? The world often wants a, a type of savior, and our sinful nature wants a powerful warrior, a supremely <laughs> intelligent being, a compassionate leader who cares about his followers. The Jewish the rulers uh, and leaders were looking for a savior to overthrow the oppressive Roman government. They were looking for a world to become a world power again, like they had under King David and King Solomon. And even Christ's disciples wanted a savior who would be an earthly ruler. As we continue our sermon series, The Savior I Want, we will look at how people and ourselves want a powerful hero. And we may not always see that in Jesus. Our sinful nature wants a Savior that looks like a winner, an earthly champion. The Savior I want is one that looks like a hero. But the Savior we need is one who acts like a spiritual hero. This is the first time that Jesus clearly predicted his impending suffering and death. From here on, he continued to speak about it often and uh, repeatedly and plainly. And he spoke this way so that his disciples would understand that being the Christ did not make him an earthly ruler. And that's why Jesus usually referred to himself not as the Messiah, but as the Son of Man. Jesus began to teach them, many, uh, teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the uh, experts in the law, be killed, and then three days rise again. He was speaking plainly to them. The Son of God must suffer, be rejected, be killed, and then rise again. He said must because that's what the Old Testament scriptures taught. The Lord God declared that Satan would crush uh, uh, Christ, uh, would cr crush Christ's heel. That means inflict pain on him. But ultimately, Christ would crush Satan. By saying must, Jesus alerted his disciples that this could not be avoided if they and their people were to be, uh, all people were to be saved. The Old Testament scriptures did not explicitly say who would cause Jesus to suffer and die. It hinted at it by saying the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. But here, Jesus identifies the builders as the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law. They would reject the cornerstone. These men constituted the 71 members of the Jewish High Court, or Sanhedrin, which were responsible for religious and uh, uh, political decisions in Judea. So what do we hear? We hear that my Savior is a failure, right? We hear that he must suffer, be rejected, and killed. And this mission came as a, a shock to his disciples. And yet the prophet Isaiah clearly stated this about the Lord's servant. He had no attractiveness and no majesty when we saw him. There was nothing about his appearance that made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man who knew grief. He was well acquainted with suffering, like someone whom people cannot look at. He was despised and we thought nothing of him. The disciples were so shocked by the fact that their Savior would suffer and die, they constantly forgot about his rising again. So how do we respond? You can't be serious, right? I'm going to follow a winner. And Jesus doesn't look like a winner. He looks like a loser. A winner is 
supposed to do it that, that is not supposed to be uh, suffer, die, and be rejected and killed. A, a hero is supposed to be powerful and impressive and royal. We aren't attracted to Christ's presence. He was despised and rejected, familiar with grief and well acquainted with suffering. People couldn't even bear to look at him as he was suffering. And then, and ultimately, they kind of considered him a noble. Then Jesus, uh, Peter spoke to Jesus privately and began to admonish him. He tried to persuade him that under no circumstance would Jesus ever have to uh, be killed and die. Peter's reaction shows us that he and the other disciples had faulty expectations of what Christ's mission really was. And that's when Jesus answers Peter and he directs his reply to all the disciples since they all needed correction. But turning, after turning around and looking at his disciples, Peter rejected, uh, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have, a, have your mind set on the things of God, but on the things of men. Peter had his will in mind, not God's. So what did Jesus mean? It's not as it seems. He says, My suffering equals your salvation. In speaking to, Je to Peter as he did, uh, Peter didn't, uh, uh, to Jesus as he did, Peter didn't knowingly cause, uh, support the cause of Satan. He wanted Jesus to avoid all the suffering and death and receive only power and riches and glory. And this agrees completely with what we want for ourselves, right? We want to enjoy luxury without any suffering. We want to enjoy the finer things in life, uh, possess all the toys, the sports cars, the lavish food, and the fine wine. We want the freedom of maybe owning a business, but we don't want all the, the challenges that come with making it successful. We want the glory of going to heaven, but we don't want God to allow us to suffer extensive misery and pain. But avoiding all the suffering and death did not agree with God's plan of salvation. As Isaiah says, but it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for our sin, for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has um, laid, has charged all our guilt to him. Thank God that Jesus responded the way he did. He rebuked Peter's well-intended but reckless approach. Without Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection, we would remain sinners and be lost forever. So what do we hear? That my life will be miserable. Jesus tells the crowd what it means to follow him. He called the crowd together and his disciples together and told them, if anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Many people in the crowd had been only following Jesus for uh, material reasons. And many were leaving when uh, it became clear that Jesus wasn't willing to be an earthly king. And by not enticing them with phony promises of earthly glory and free food, they abandoned him. Jesus showed his, by this though, Jesus showed his dedication to his Father's mission. Following Jesus or denying myself uh, I, needs to be the primary focus in life. God will need to be that focus in, in life. And that involves sacrifices, avoiding anything that may come between us and our Savior. God may ask us to endure uh, ridicule or hardship for our faith, to suffer shame or death to remain faithful to Him. In countless countries today, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. In our own country, Christians are uh, the atheistic propaganda that is in the courts is growing, and now, now it commonly affects courts' decisions. Teens in public high schools and students in college are belittled and, and impeded in their careers because of the Christian faith. How will, we, how, how will we respond? You can't be serious. How is suffering good? God's Word teaches that God is good to his people and that he punishes the wicked. But when we look around, it's kind of like the psalmist. He sees people suffering and the good people suffering and the evil people prospering. And he wonders, as we do, why do bad things happen to good people? 
Maybe he thought, maybe God doesn't really care about right and wrong. And maybe God is powerless to destroy evil. The psalmist says, but as for me, my feet almost slipped out from under me. I almost lost my footing. I even envied the arrogant when I observed the peace of the wicked. For there are no struggles at their death. Their bodies are sturdy. We do not have the trouble common to people. They are not plagued with the rest of mankind. Envy is a caustic acid that erodes contentment and faith. And we may envy the wicked because they seem to be more prosperous than us. Our frustration, though, is often more self-pity than zeal for God's honor. The prosperity of the wicked may trouble us so much that we may be in danger of losing our faith. The psalmist says, when I tried to understand this, I was very, uh, it was very troubling to me until I went to the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. Grumbling or complaining about the way that God is managing our life or our lives does, not, does damage to our lives, but it also can be discouraging to other Christians who hear it. By failing to rejoice in the Lord, we pull other Christians down rather than build them up. Fortunately, the psalmist Asaph regained his balance by listening to God's word, by worshiping in God's house before he lost his faith. Will you? One of the reasons for suffering is to draw us closer to God and to trust in his promises. What Jesus meant is not what it seems. Your suffering or cross equals your crown. Jesus says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Our Savior Jesus proposes the blessed truth of discipleship. Whoever is willing to uh, lose his life for Jesus will discover that he has lost nothing but gained everything. The Greek grammar adds certainty to the results of following, uh, any, uh, uh, following oneself for Jesus. Your life will either be lost or it will be saved. It's important to know that Jesus specifically emphasizes that losing one's life for the gospel will save it eternally. After all, Jesus says, what, is, uh, what good is it if a man were to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Any rational person can see that the proper choice is, to the Savior's question is, is that, that the accumulated wealth of the world would not be the worth, worth the loss of a single soul, even your soul. The acquiring of perishable riches, no matter how many or how much, can never compare with the loss of anything imperishable, even for a moment. Our Savior's rhetorical question reminds us of Psalm 49.7. The ransom of a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. No amassing of good works can ever be offered in exchange for the salvation of the soul. Our repeated attempts to merit God's favor always fall short of God's standard of perfection. But when you are declared innocent or righteous through Jesus, you are rich for an eternity in heaven. As we consider the value of our soul, the inability uh, of us to merit its freedom, and the incredible sacrifice that Jesus made to win it all for eternity, it leads us to sacrifice everything with joy and do it willingly. In fact, Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Our Savior shows the eternal faith of those who deny Christ, and that's eternal punishment. In this adulterous and sinful generation, it is possible for people to be ashamed of Jesus because he isn't the earthly hero that people want him to be. Adulterers are lovers of the world as typified by the Pharisees who love praise from people more than praise from God. Discovered adultery brings shame to a person. Being ashamed of Jesus is the very worst kind of adultery. Christians need to focus on the blessings of their marriage to Christ, the bridegroom, and not the sinful worldly logic that makes us makes it appear beautiful and shame. 
the hymn writer says, Ashamed of Jesus, that dear friend, on whom my hopes of heaven depend, know when I blush, be this my shame, that I no more revere his name. Our Savior's return could be at any time. In the final appearance, of uh, will display the Father's glory, which will bring praise and joy, not shame. The holy angels, God's special creatures in heaven, will silence all the tongues of proud men. Whatever, uh, what believer could not rejoice confidently in being justified by faith and the certain hope of receiving God's glory? The epistle says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, that is, declared righteous and holiness, uh, holiness through Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, and it is Jesus, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently in, in, on the basis of the, our hope for the glory of God. Not only this, but we rejoice in, uh, uh, in our suffering, confidently in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces patient endurance, and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame, because God lo God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. The Savior we want is one that looks like a hero, a champion, a winner. But the Savior that we need is one that acts like a spiritual hero, who fulfilled his Father's plan to suffer, die, and rise again so that we may live forever. Our Savior's loving sacrifice should inspire us to tell others about our spiritual hero, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who conquered death for us and will someday reward us with eternal life in heaven. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the uh, reciting of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, that is on page 41 or on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there we will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the Spirit, enable each of us in our spirit to be fruitful in every good work. Give us a love so deep that we will desire to share our possessions and be moved to give generous offerings to the glory of your Heavenly Father, who spared us 
spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Use our gifts to send the message of salvation in Jesus' name out to the world. Hear us for our Savior's sake. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Included in our prayers this morning are prayers of thanks for Carol Pratt, who was hospitalized uh, all of last week. Um, for Jan Kitley, who um, Marlene Huttenlocker suggested a prayer for because she was a, a friend and a, a co worker. And then also for Marlene Huttenlocker, who uh, was involved in a car accident last night and uh, who has uh, some injuries. We pray. Uh, we'll use the prayer, I'm going to do a switch, uh, the prayer for Lent, which is page um, 125, if you've used that responsive prayer for, for Lent on 125. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the loss. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing them. O oh Lord, compassionate Father, in your mercy you transform even sickness and disease in the, into a blessing for your children. With this confidence we commit all who are sick and suffering to your tender, tender care. We pray especially for Carol Pratt and are thankful that she is no longer hospitalized. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy, grant patient endurance if her suffering must linger, help her find the true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross during this time of physical weakness. We also come to you today and uh, uh, pray for the family of Jan Kitley who uh, was taken to her eternal home uh, because of cancer. And um, while we don't always understand your plan, and death is part of the world. Uh, we know that with you there is resurrection to eternal life. And we pray uh, that the family of Jan Kitley would remember that. Uh, that those who are his children uh, are uh, with you forever. And that the family can have comfort and uh, hope during uh, this difficult time. We also pray for Marlene Huttenlocker, uh, who uh, was involved in a car accident in which she has five broken ribs. Uh, we don't know uh, all uh, the, the ramifications or the difficulties with that, but we do know that uh, broken ribs uh, take a while to mend and that it, it often makes it hard to breathe. We pray if it is your will that you would shorten her recovery, uh, heal her ribs, and, um, and one day have her again worship with us. Uh, we pray uh, that her loved ones uh, would put their comfort and strength in you and, and in this uh, shepherd who has served this church so well for so many years. 
We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue by singing the next hymn, 347. <laughs>
the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.